Hekima was curated by Agan Odero Agan. Kenyan art practice as one of the main principles. And in that we're looking at how um, the emerging artists are doing now, what the, our elder artists used to do, how they use uh, their experiences, and uh, we're trying to figure out a way such a way that um, both can, uh, can have conversations between and within. The second principle, of course, it's beauty. And um, Africa is beauty, as in it's very beautiful. Almost everything we touch is very beautiful. The Urembo exhibition explored beauty symbols, colors, designs, and their meanings over time. Each and every artwork that I receive, I do justice to it in terms of um, how it's displayed. Um, I get the power from it, as in wherever I put it, uh, it makes sense to one, to the artist, and two, of course, to the people coming to, to see it and experience it. We want people to draw knowledge from all these old artifacts. And uh, we've brought in quite a number of uh, elderly artists. We've brought in quite a number of elders from different communities and we want people to draw a lot of knowledge from them. Some of the artifacts on the walls, eh? it's these elders that know how they were used. Sain Wadu and Eunice Wadu, who are celebrated artists in Kenya and abroad, were handy to offer their advice. I was able to be a teacher, which did not please me. I was able to be a court clerk, it did not please me. So what was pleasing me? That was my consciousness, you know? I needed something that has to, uh, to be roaring out of me, not coming like a, a tape reverse and then tape replay, you know, creativity, something that was more creative. So as a parent, you, 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 you force it to the child, but that is not where the child exactly will fit because you find, you qualified with a B, he did, you qualified with an engineer, but in the final ed, you find yourself shifting to another field that you feel is more appropriate to you. It's not bad, but usually forcing it is like trying to, doesn't, doesn't help, because I'll do it half-heartedly. Art is a very, very, very good medicine because if personally I am um, in a stress mood, I start playing the, 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 with the colors, with those knives. Whatever was disturbing me will come out naturally. Due to customs, some children are not able to express themselves. When they are distressed, they don't speak. But when you give them the, the art materials, they'll express themselves very freely without being pushed to do it. And whatever is disturbing them will come to an end. Through their initiative in Naivasha, Sain Wadu to Art Trust, the duo have debunked the myths associated with art. Give freedom to the children to do what they love most. Because sometimes art is regarded as abnormal field, abnormal professions. It is a profession like any other. I was inspired by my husband and a friend. By then we were not married, I could uh, read. I could read through the painting he has done. So the message he was trying to to pass, I could read it, and uh, from there I, I decided I also want to express myself through the the pieces that I I can create, and then I did it, and uh, of course I've exhibited like almost all over the world. They are published in the, in uh, some books, art books. So really. I've struggled. And then I have to look at this picture of mine. Where layers would I like to, to have a color white? The influence that has given me is my personal suspicion. Because like you say, the, 
Arts Trust. I've been working with village, village kids, children, and I've worked with them until I've had people maturing into adults and earning through art that we have taught them. So that's, that's a bit of, I love it because it's part of our past ourselves now, seeing like we are qualified out. Yeah, we have already uh, pushed the seats out. Huh. Every Saturday morning, that's a day I have volunteered myself with my husband and family. That's our ten percent. We give it to to the community. We work with the children, and I'm so happy working when I give back to my community because this is a God-given talent. Witnessing how indigenous apprenticeship and community stewardship can and do inform artistic practice today. Hence, connecting our past and present was fulfilling. Many a times we're inspired either knowingly or, or unknowingly uh, whenever you're doing uh, any, 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 any artwork. For example, I, I'm sure you've seen um, a lot of paintings based on musical instruments. Chances are some of them have never even seen the, 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 the eight stringed or the six stringed. Quite possible. Uh, you've seen so many paintings or, or sculptures done based on, on guards uh, with very intricate designs on it, um, knowingly or unknowingly. Uh, you've seen so many abstracts that have been done based on some of the, these cultural uh, stories, I mean the folklore, um, the artifacts, and most of them it's either knowingly or unknowingly. For example, the, 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 the folklore. That's our stories that have, we have been told by our grandmothers, by, you know, by our aunties. Those are things that at times we put into our art. And with that, we are drawing knowledge from, from what we got from either our grandmother or our, or our aunties. So it's something that is con continually happening. And we hope um, it won't stop. Because uh, it's, it's also a way of, of us passing that cultural knowledge, that traditional knowledge to the future. The exhibitions were accompanied by a series of lectures, classes, ceremonies, and discussions. This was aimed at educating the visitors about the ways our inherited knowledge is still relevant today. We are not growing to be younger again. And at the present time, of course, I understand I'll live longer, but I cannot live longer than what I've lived. So what do I leave to the people that I met there? I want, we wanted to have a legacy. We live our artwork with those people. Wadu, who has been a practicing visual artist for over 30 years, has seen it all. It has been rough, tough, and uh, demanding. It's all about struggle, because visual artists in the country is more or less unrecognized by the institutions that should be. In the beginning I was doing, I, I learned to paint using uh, leftover paints which I had borrowed from my friend. You know, those were watercolors and maybe I qualified to uh, another type of borrowed leftovers oil and then I came to gouache and then I came to acrylic and then I came to oils. So usually, usually I mean oils. Assistance, perseverance. Yeah, and of course, most times imagining I'm not, I'm not uh, wrong, you know. Yeah, because if you're wrong, you'll come. You, that mood will always be moody, you know. You know, you just, you just assume, assume, you know, that assumption will give you strength to move to the next step. Experimentation in the choice of one's career path is inevitable at some point. However. Consciousness kept Wadu focused on art. I had to abandon my, uh, the works that I was doing. One time I was a court clerk. At another time I was a teacher. But those were not meeting my, uh, 
not a credentials, was were not meeting my satisfaction. So I decided not to. And then the villagers interpreted that to mean this guy is kind of gone nuts. So it's like referring to you guy like you are his man. I don't know, he's his man. But of course, there's a point I wanted to prove. And when I mastered what I've been longing for, art, I decided, of course, you guys have been saying I'm, say, I'm, I'm insane. Certainly, I am sane. And so, I am sane to now. He attests the significance of art. It's just trying to open up everyone's mind. So, like, for this one now, we had uh, this, the Tika workshop right now. We had nearly all the tribes incorporated into that. You come with your contribution. How do you interpret, you know, that situation we are in, you know? All the 40 tribes, 42 tribes have been there. And I think the result were positive. My goal is to be a success, a success and to be an inspirator. May the integration of contemporary artwork with cultural artifacts prevail. To the elderly, I want to say Asante. Um, you guys have, have, have made the Kenyan art scene to be what it is today. Uh, you've always been there whenever we come for your, for your advices and uh, we are grateful. And uh, we ask that you continue you know, being open to us um, and just try to guide us. Let beauty radiate on every part of our lives. episode of Kona. Nini ni onafanya? Machamp uwa wa fight hivyo. What did you want anyway? He didn't help out one way for free. I'm not judging you. Everyone else did. I know exactly what it's like to be judged by society. I've never seen him this upset. Hold up in his office for like the past two days. Watch out. Any ideas? Z. You're lying. of excellence and of the honor of my ancestors my great ancestors whose successor I am I am proud I am Justin's mother and how can a mother bear to see her child being killed by someone ever on the next episode Come on, Ramon and Juan are two different people, Mom. But they are still the same. Nobody can convince me that she does not want any of that money. They are simply lying in wait to steal the whole lot of it. I am going to talk to Antonio. But what for? What gives you the right to have an opinion about my life? If you ask me, then I'll tell you what I think. El paraíso in love with Ramon. Very good morning to you. We are coming to you live from KBC Channel One, right here in Kenya's capital, Nairobi. The program that begins right now is News Check. Today we want to focus on matters education. 
It is among the sectors that have been paralyzed by the outbreak of coronavirus that since has claimed a five 172,000 lives globally and as we looked at, at the numbers the latest figures now stand at over 13 million positive cases of coronavirus globally. Yesterday in our country we were given the latest numbers and as we speak this particular morning today of course the numbers ought to have gone higher. We are past the 10,000 mark. Uh, over 10,200 people tested positive to COVID-19 and so far about 197 people have succumbed to this deadly pandemic. In our country it is an outbreak that has caused havoc and several sectors have been brought almost to their knees because of the restrictions that were put in place by the government through the Ministry of Health to curb the spread of COVID-19. Among these key sectors is the education uh, sector and that is what we want to focus on this particular morning. Before we begin our conversation, I want to take you through uh, some of the issues that have been shaping conversations in the last few days when it comes to the education sector. My name is uh, Safin Acheng Oma, and our sign language interpreter is uh, Susan Thuku. Now, le let me help you understand some of the figures and the numbers uh, that we have when it comes to uh, the number of learners who have been affected by the closure of schools, which is one of the measures that were put in place to contain the spread of COVID-19. Globally, over 1.5 billion learners have been affected by the closure of schools. Several schools in different countries remain closed. We saw other countries attempt to reopen their learning institutions, and then there was a surge on the positive cases of COVID-19, and they had to revert back to the closure of schools. And then we want to look at our situation on the ground right here in Kenya. I was looking at the Ministry of Education's COVID-19 Response and Recovery Plan that was published in May 2020. And some of the numbers they were giving us at that particular time is that over 90,000 schools were closed and this was something that was done following the presidential directive which was issued in the week of 16th March 2020 between 16th of March and 20th 20, 20 March 2020 and of course this went ahead to affect about 18 million learners who are affected this touch on those who are in pre-primary and primary and secondary schools across the country we are not even talking about uh, the tertiary institutions like colleges and universities these are just uh, learners who are in pre-primary primary and secondary school and you're also looking at another interesting population of learners this is over 150,000 refugees are now confined at home they cannot be able to continue with uh, learning now let's uh, move just to get to understand a clear picture on how the situation is like in uh, some of the uh, learning institutions now since the schools closed that was on 16th of March 2020. The government has tried to put in place efforts uh, just to make sure there is seamless learning uh, ahead of schools reopening. There were quite a lot of conversations that were taking place with key stakeholders in the sector to ensure that schools reopen, but they reopen at the right time and in the right way to ensure the safety of learners and the staff at the learning institutions. But these are some of the issues that have been going on. Uh, one of them includes strengthening of the Kenya Education Cloud. This is just to facilitate digital uh, learning. There was also, we've seen quite a lot of effort being put in place to provide radio and television education programs. Uh, this is also something that has been spearheaded by the KICD. And uh, we've seen the government also supporting access to teaching and learning materials like uh, textbooks among other materials that are needed in learning during this particular time if you can just look at some of the uh, efforts uh, more efforts that the government has put in place uh, to ensure that there is seamless uh, learning and of course they also touch on improving uh, water and uh, sanitation infrastructure of course this is something that still has a long way to go going forward there's still a gap that needs to be filled when it comes to ensuring that all learning institutions have improved their sanitation and water infrastructure to ensure the safety of learners when schools reopen. There is also a lot of effort going on in terms of creating knowledge on health and hygiene. Remember, it's a pandemic that is still being studied. Many people are yet to really fully understand uh, this particular pandemic. So a lot of awareness is really needed in the society and it is going to be key in ensuring that we are safe when schools reopen. Learners need to be equipped with the right kind of knowledge. Now, where do we stand when it comes to the status of education going forward? 
as at the 7th of July 2020 from the announcement that was issued by the Education CS Professor George Magoha. He gave quite a number of directives. This is according to a report that a, a, a comprehensive team of key, play, uh, key players in the education sector sat together for quite a number of time and talked about quite a lot of issues that touch on how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected the education sector and gave proposals on the way forward. So the CS announced that this year's candidate this year's academic calendar is considered lost. The academic calendar, which usually runs between January and November for this year, 2020, there is really no, nothing much that has gone on in the education sector. So for, for us as a country where we stand, it is considered lost. And the 2020 KCSC and KCP examinations have been cancelled. That is where we stand as at today. And then all basic learning institutions uh, will reopen in January 2020 as we speak. But then this is something that the CS says. It depends on how the situation will be like because that is the time we expect that if things go well, the curve ought to be flattening. So uh, still a lot of considerations need to be put in place. It's not cast in stone, but a lot of conversations are going to continue. So the status of education sector, those are some of the issues that uh, we have as we speak. But then going forward, students will therefore have to repeat their classes. This is because they've not gone through uh, the required, uh, you know, they've not covered the syllabus as much as it was expected. Of course, it is an issue that is debatable because some private, sec uh, private schools really invested in online learning and for some feel they have done the much that they can. So the issue of repeating classes is still drawing a lot of divided opinion and this will form part of our conversation this morning with stakeholders who are with me in studio. But then other issues also are that as we speak this particular morning, learning institutions have been directed to refund or carry forward school fees that had been paid in advance by parents or caregivers. Now decisions, these decisions apply to all learners, including those offering international curriculum. So it is something that touch on not just the public schools, the private schools, and even the ones that are offering international curriculum. So that is what uh, the status uh, situation is like as that uh, the 7th of uh, July 2020, according to the CS in the Ministry of Education. Now, looking at uh, the Aside from the basic education, technical and vocational education and training institutions, popularly known as TVET institutions and colleges, are set to reopen in the month of uh, September. And of course, face-to-face -face learning in universities will take place on a case-by-case -case basis. These two decisions actually depend on how best these learning institutions are going to implement the precautionary measures to curb the spread of COVID-19. So not all institutions will be guaranteed reopening. They will have to be inspected to ensure that they've adhered to all the uh, issued protocols uh, that are required by the Ministry of Health. Now, going forward, universities should continue holding virtual learning and graduations for students who have su successfully completed their programs and met graduation requirements. We've seen this happening in quite a number of universities, so something that should continue. It's safe to do it this way as we uh, wait to reopen our learning institutions and, of course, resume to no normalcy going forward. Now, these are just some of the issues uh, that are coming forth, the status of education as we speak this particular morning. And of course, I will be taking you through more uh, issues even as we continue interacting with my guests in studio this particular morning. I just want to add on to the fact that the Ministry of Education is set to issue a comprehensive circular on the reopening of schools. Also, the Kenya National Ed Ed Examination Council is expected to issue a revised examination timetable for the 2020 Standard 8 and uh, Form 4 candidates. So this year, there's not going to be any national ex examinations, and we're expecting a directive on when this is going to happen in the year 2021, most probably. So we want to begin our conversation after we let you know what you're also tracking for you this particular morning. Remember, it's a comprehensive program that takes you to different events as they happen. And we track the latest developments of these particular issues for you. And this is our reporter's diary, just to give you a glimpse of what our reporters are out and about tracking this morning.
right, so those are some of the uh, events we are following up for you right here in Nairobi and, of course, in other counties. Kisumu, Mombasa will be linking you up with those events when we receive the updates. Now, we want to begin our conversation in studio this particular morning, and we know for a fact from uh, the numbers that we've just shared with you earlier that now, as we stand, over 1 billion learners have been affected uh, globally as a result of the closure of learning institutions. There's quite a lot of conversation going on on how to reopen schools, what are the safety precautions that ought to be put in place. But this will come at a cost, and this will also come with a lot of effort that have to be put in place. Coming from a background where in our education system we've already had challenges before, uh, even with the setup of our learning institutions, the population management, the teacher-student uh, ratio, how best can we implement these new directives that have been issued to safeguard us from uh, you know, the COVID-19 global pandemic? That conversation is what we want to talk about, the status of education in our country this morning. And uh, to have that conversation, I'm joined by a panel of two stakeholders, key players in the education sector. I'm talking about uh, Peter Ndoro, the CEO of the Kenya Private Schools Association. Thank you so much, sir, for creating time for us this morning. You're welcome. And of course, mm -hmm. Akelo Misori, he's the Secretary General Kupet. Thank you so much for creating time for us as well. Yeah. Hello, viewers. All right. Yeah. So we want to begin uh, straight away, uh, you know, just looking at the situation in the education sector and to help answer a lot of questions that even parents are asking themselves at this particular time. But before we get into the nitty gritties of the conversation, I just want to understand from both of you gentlemen how much of an impact are we talking about because yes we agree the COVID-19 pandemic has affected learning institutions and other sectors but then now that you're talking about the education sector from your end how much of an impact has it caused let me begin with you Akello. I uh, thank you so much it has been a real challenge since uh, March when the schools closed because of COVID-19 but was uh, is when the, uh, the situation worsened when uh, there was no feasibility of schools opening and uh, a lot of anxiety has been created uh, both in the learners, in teachers and in parents. It has been a great challenge and uh, one of the most significant challenges which are there is that quite a number of children are now uh, panicky and uh, a lot of school girls have been abused a lot of students have uh, resorted to substance and uh, drug abuse, and uh, parents have the challenge of containing the learners at home. Uh, this one brings us to understand the significance of how students or learners are mainly safe at school. Because you realize that uh, churches have been closed to almost co religious uh, groupings. And when these children go home and there is nobody to direct, parents are also looking for how to survive to earn a living out of the, the jobs which are also lost, you realize that uh, it has not been very easy. It has really caused a lot of anxiety among teachers because uh, we are also, as teachers, we are also safe at school. We are very, very comfortable when children are around and uh, we interact with them. And this particular time round, uh, quite a number of teachers are also going a lot of stress occasioned by the fact that the schools are taking too long to open. Mm -hmm. But this thing has really brought the country to a standstill. We there's a lot of disruption, and the economy has been affected adversely. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you so much for that opening statement. But then, mm -hmm. you know, in as much as there has been disruption in the education sector, the private schools have been worst hit. Mr. Ndoro, do you agree with that? Uh, thank you very much. And I think uh, let me start by uh, appreciating the fact that. Um, we are in a crisis in the education sector at this point in time. And uh, the private schools have borne the brunt of this more than any other sector. Remember, when the schools were closed in March, uh, private schools, together with the public, were asked immediately to, 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 to close shop. Private schools, unlike public schools, do not uh, depend on any other support from any other uh, quota other than fees paid for by parents when learners are in session and uh, taking their studies in school. So with COVID-19, private schools have faced enormous challenges. At the moment, we have challenges of paying the staff who are currently still in session, 
like the security people, the cleaners. We have challenges of paying our teachers who are in session at this point in time because we have no income that uh, can be able to support our teachers. We have challenges of online learning. Remember when uh, 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 this crisis uh, um, came into the country, we as an education sector, we had not trained our uh, teachers in the basic education on how to teach uh, when learners are at home because that was considered holiday tuition. But now here we are. We started looking at ways and means through which we can be able to reach out to our learners through uh, the digital uh, uh, systems. So it has been a big challenge. And now that uh, the reopening date has been pushed further from September to January, the private schools will suffer uh, again more, more, and more significantly. Because uh, if the three months private schools has borne the, 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 the brunt of uh, uh, this particular crisis because we've not been get, getting any income, now with a further six months, private schools are going to suffer uh, at the most. But I believe in the fullness of time we shall still overcome this particular challenge because we are trying to look at ways and means through which we can be able to support uh, private schools to be able to continue teaching so right. that learners and parents can appreciate the value that is uh, being given by private schools and be able to support those activities. All right. Thank you. And, and we'll be talking about uh, some of those you know, ways and means uh, that we ought to implement to support private schools going forward just as a, as a way of you know, finding uh, a solution that, that can work in this particular situation later. But then let's go back to the genesis of this whole problem. Uh, it's just uh, on the 11th of March 2020 when the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a global pandemic. Then two days later on the 13th of March in our country we recorded the first case of COVID-19. Of course, obviously, as expected, that caused a lot of anxiety. A lot of measures were put in place to curb its spread, which included the closure of schools. And many have been questioning uh, probably what could have inspired this decision. And this question I'd like you to address, Akelo. If you look at the setup of our learning institutions, let's just talk about when it all started. What is it that you see that ought to have made these institutions a high risk area for the spread of COVID-19 that may have you know, justified the need for closure of schools? Uh, thank you so much. It would be important for us to note that uh, our schools, uh, the way they are constructed, do not, to a large extent, conform to the, the standards which are required, especially if a contagious disease like COVID-19 now comes in. Uh, we have got very small classroom sizes, and we also have got uh, over-enrollment of our, our schools, especially in public schools. Well, for even for the private uh, uh, schools, the challenge which we have is that the area in which many of them are constructed is also confined. So the establishing a very good environment uh, where we could even establish what we call social distance uh, is a real challenge. So one major problem is infrastructure in schools. Our classes are buttressed because the population is too much. In many instances, teachers teach classes which resemble pu public or uh, political rally institutions. So those were some circumstances which meditated. But another thing which is very important, according to World Health Organization, and all especially those countries which are managing the system, the, the situation, is that you need a source of water. Uh, many of our schools are not supplied with the water. They are really constrained. So this is something which has never been an issue. Another, another major component is this, the cleanliness, the sanitation area in many of our schools is really wanting. But when you look at also the other aspect, especially when you address the issue of accommodation, quite a number of schools in Kenya are boarding schools. And you realize that with a 100% transition, quite a number of schools could not cope up with the numbers which they were admitting. So you realize that when you go to a dormitory, a dormitory has got a triple bed, a triple decker for that matter. Mm -hmm. So how would you uh, sustain that kind of arrangement in a school situation when this disease is, be, is being transported, uh, transfor uh, trans transported by contact. The infection is uh, mainly uh, uh, fueled by contact. And if the dormitory itself is uh, uh, congested, the classrooms are congested, how would we survive? So these are the, the issues which militated against us, just uh, mm -hmm prolonging the, the stay, and therefore I thought 
the decision by the government and the Ministry of Education to close down school was well intended and was timely enough. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. And you know, these issues you're raising are not issues that are new. The issues that have ailed the education sector for decades are the po population management, the teachers, you know, the, the even the setup of the dormitories and everything. It has been a, a challenge over time. I don't know if we can borrow from the private sector, Mr. Ndoro. What is it that you feel has worked? Because we've heard this uh, quote unquote uh, uh, saying that uh, private schools are better managed. Most parents actually prefer, if they can afford, that their children attend uh, private schools. What is it that you think has worked that has failed elsewhere? Uh, thank you very much uh, for that recognition that the private schools have been doing a, a good job. But let me uh, say that um, private schools have succeeded uh, because of efficient use of resources that is available to them. If we are to talk about uh, uh, the resources available to private schools, you'll find that very many private schools across the country have limited resources in terms of space, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of uh, teachers and things like that. But private schools have used those resources efficiently. One of the things that uh, the private sector has recognized is that, um, for example, the issues of hygiene. And therefore, with time, a majority of the private schools had uh, made arrangements to provide uh, water for, for, the, for the learners and uh, the teachers and uh, other members of staff within those institutions. So we had somehow uh, quite a number of our schools having established uh, water infrastructure in schools. So with the coming in of the COVID-19, it will not be, in as much as it will be a challenge, but for most of the private schools, they have sources of uh, uh, water. And that's why we are saying that um, private schools have been able to, 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 to efficiently uh, use that opportunity. At the same time, when we look at our classroom sizes, we have uh, managed to keep our numbers low because for us, we know very well that uh, for us to deliver quality learning, and be able to have parents and other stakeholders trust the private schools, you must be able to have a manageable number. So for us, we have admitted the numbers that we can be able to manage. And the moment we increase that number, of course, that also uh, calls for increase in infrastructure. And like the public sector, where uh, the law demands that the government must be able to provide education to the citizens. So when a child goes to school, irrespective of whether there is, uh, the, the, the infrastructure is there or not, they have to be admitted. So it complicates and gives the public sector quite a number of uh, challenges. But for us in the private sector, we only admit the number that we can be able to manage. And the moment we have more number, we are able to, 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 pop, to put up infrastructure to be able to accommodate the numbers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mr. Kelo, probably you know, we can borrow from how we've done this before to ensure the success of what we are going to do to ensure that uh, our learning institutions are ready for reopening in a safe manner uh, during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. If you look at how we have tried to improve uh, the infrastructure in some of these learning institutions in the past, before even COVID-19, where do you think are some of the loopholes we need to mend? Is it lack of funds or the management of these schools? What is it that is failing that probably would lead us to be having so many challenges in the education sector? Uh, thank you so much. I think one major problem that we have had in the public sector education is the fact that uh, we have allowed a lot of politics to take uh, advantage of the freedoms which are there that the education is a right and therefore any MCA, any member of parliament would wish to establish a school, especially the use of uh, uh, the CDA, for example, has been uh, not been efficient because that is one area, budget line, which they are allowed to spend it. So you'll realize that uh, what the public, uh, 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 what the politicians are doing is that they go there and they think that education and schooling is done within the four walls. So somebody goes there and says that I've given you 500,000, can you put a classroom? And uh, once the classroom has been put, they don't care whether the finishing is appropriate for, 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 for learning purposes. They don't care whether it is important to provide uh, facilities in the same, same classroom. So these are real challenges which can be done. So my view uh, and how we could have done things better was to restrict, restrict 
uh, the establishment of schools according to populations. And that one would uh, help a lot to, to govern that. Maybe this is a, a place we, where 3,000 households live. What, how, what number of schools do they require? They maybe require one secondary school and one or two primary schools. So that at least when two primary schools churn out candidates for secondary schools, they go to one secondary school. But you realize in this country that every village has got um, uh, a secondary school and has, uh, uh, so many primary schools, which in, in real sense do not meet the, the criteria of standards which can provide quality education. Mm -hmm. So the policy arrangement is also very weak because the registration of schools is, is indiscriminate because once the community has mobilized themselves, they have built a school, the, 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 the director of education has no option but to register. So the template we are using to register school is a very outdated one. You remember in the past, uh, what you used to define a school was that where 10 or so are undergoing instruction. And it did not matter whether it was under three or not. That's the reason for which when you look at uh, this, even uh, the, 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 the number of uh, years that we have had with the, uh, the CDF going, you could still find that far some parts of this nation the children are still undergoing uh, instruction under trees. Mm. So with this COVID-19, it has really uh, opened the, our, our underbelly that we have never been doing things correctly and now we are rushing. Now it is, it is, it is, it is going to be a real challenge that people think that the six months we have towards the end of the year is a long time. As we talk currently, nobody is thinking about uh, building schools. Everybody is focused on what uh, Professor Magoa is doing at Jogo. And no MCA, no member of parliament think uh, about how to create space in the existing primary schools. Mm -hmm. But, but you, you, you've just, sorry to cut you short, you've yeah. just queried yeah. uh, the challenge that has been posed by the mushrooming of schools. Yes. Why then again would you see a possibility of building more we, schools? We, we are just saying that they, oh, the already existing ones have got registra registered students or learners for this matter. What we expect is that they should now go back, start thinking about how January will open. Because we think that we will open in the old normal. The old normal is never going to be used as a criteria of standing education in 2021. Mm -hmm. We must go there knowing very well that the idea of social distance will remain. Because this is a pandemic. And according to the reports from the health experts, they are telling us that uh, this thing is highly contagious, and we cannot take chance with it. We cannot negotiate with the virus. Now, if we are not going to negotiate with the virus, how will we open schools which are in existence? The, poli the policy must be reworked. They, all the players, be they uh, boards of management, be they community leaders, be they members of parliament, must re go to the back to the drawing board. We need a very proper leg legislation to, to work on this area of, edu or in this area of education. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you know, when you're talking about a, a, a contagious uh, disease such as COVID-19, and you look at the population we are talking about this morning, these are learners, and the ones that are even in the basic education, these are young children, which is just a delicate population that really needs maximum protection from all forms of diseases, not just COVID-19. But then before I go to uh, Ndoro, I, I just want to ask you, how do you think, uh, Akelo, this is going to play out when we want to implement the social distancing directive in our learning institutions? Do we probably foresee a situation where some learners may not be allowed back into schools when schools say they cannot accommodate that much of a population at a time? Will, will, will some learners probably miss their slots? I must say that uh, myself and Dolo were in that committee, and those are things that we, we tried to discuss. One thing which is evident is that the, 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 the establishment, the, the political establishment of this nation may not be for the idea of having learning faced or some learners stay at home. The reason for which we are moving to the next year is that we must now plan well that everybody is going back to school. The idea of, you know, remember 2022 is going to be election year. Mm. And the children have been away for a whole year. There is fear of repeating class, as you men mentioned in your introduction. What is going to happen is that we expect the entire school to open and all learners to be in school by 2021. 
What that one calls for is an advanced preparation in readiness. We know very well that the population of learners in public school is just uh, uh, too big. But there are schools with higher numbers. The period we have between now, Jul July, and January should be used to plan on how we can, for example, mm -hmm. ensure that we supply schools with uh, a source of water so that when learners resume learning, they can, they're already being taught how to wash their hands as they go. It is good the private sector has really shown the way. But another thing is, for those schools with high numbers, this is an area to invest. We must now try to start building one uh, for maybe for the next two years, having learning taking place in temporary structures, which are COVID compliant, mm -hmm to cater for the high numbers that we have. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, if that one does not happen, it will be dangerous. But another thing which is also contingent to this, we must also increase teacher numbers in public schools. Because once classrooms are split to manage the social distance uh, uh, as a strategy, we need to have teachers to manage those classes. So this is an area for parliament to relook at the budget which is given to Teacher Service Commission so that many more teachers are contracted. Remember, we have got also a, a, a aging, an aging population of teachers. According to the report which we, law, we got last from the last meeting, the Teacher Service Commission CEO said that they also have the problem of aging population of teachers. So we need to have more robust, youthful teachers injected into the service. And that is why it is important that people must engage in serious conversation about how we are going to repay in January. Mm -hmm. Not just to wait for that day to come, and then people will start running up and down to look for where to, to, to get uh, the, uh, the help. Mm -hmm. yeah. And a big population of these robust teachers uh, who still have the energy have been absorbed under the board of management, and some are even serving in private uh, sector. But these are people, if you look at what is happening even on social media, quite a number of teachers have really lost their jobs. Uh, others have gone on unpaid leave. Others are receiving pay cuts. A lot of issues that still needs to be uh, discussed going forward. But we'll talk about the welfare of teachers later. I'd like, you know, uh, Peter to also uh, chip into this conversation and tell me how the private sector has been coping during this particular time, uh, during the COVID-19. What are some of the issues that uh, you know, were put in place uh, as, as sort of a survival tactic for private schools in the country. What has been happening both on the good side and on the bad side? Uh, thank you very much. Before I get into that, allow me to add to what uh, Akello Misori has said about preparation for reopening in 2021. Because at this point in time, we have said the schools are going to reopen in 2021. But we haven't quite clearly figured out how is that reopening going to be done? We know very well that uh, we may not be having uh, uh, post-COVID anytime soon. So when the children go back to school, how are they going to go back to school? It is high time that all the stakeholders involved to start planning on how they are going to manage the numbers that we have. This is the time, because six months is not a lot of time. It's a very, very short period of time to figure out because we need to ask ourselves, how do we provide water for washing hands and sanitation? How are we going to provide uh, the face masks? How are we going to deal with the monster of uh, social and physical distancing in our educational institutions? How are we going to manage that? Because that is going to be a very big issue. And this being a contagious disease, that has to be sorted out. We are also going to, 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 to need to address on the, the issue of health. How do we uh, 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 respond when we have cases in schools? What needs to be done? How are we going to train our teachers in the new normal? How are they going to behave when the schools reopen and after the, 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 the schools reopen? How are they going to, 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 to behave? Those are fundamental, critical issues that must be addressed, be addressed before 2021. Coming to your question about the private schools, I said earlier that private schools have been the most affected institutions in as far as COVID-19 is concerned, because for them, they lost the income 
and therefore private schools have been looking at ways and means through which they can be able to uh, continue engaging learners in, uh, in education. And one of the things that uh, we looked at uh, is uh, the online learning. And we want to thank KICD because they have been giving us uh, uh, digital content. They have made it available. They have uh, been doing something through um, radio, television, and, uh, and uh, Kenya Private Schools Association has also, through its own initiative, developed a program that is supporting schools on online learning. We have been able to look at a program that will see uh, learners get uh, devices, get uh, content, get uh, teacher training, and also uh, provide some level of assessment so that we can keep our teachers engaged and we can have our learners continue learning. So that with this uh, learning that will be taking place, we can be able to generate some resources to be able to facilitate our teachers and be able to continue with the online learning. Mm -hmm. That is what we have been doing at this point in time. Right. Has yeah. that worked in, in, in terms of even the coverage of the syllabus and the content that is being delivered to learners? Would you say it has been effective from where you sit? Uh, I can't say it has been 100% effective, no, because we have had a challenge, especially the lower grades have not been uh, participating much in, uh, in online learning, though we have actually started and enhanced that. But I can comfortably say that we are getting there. We are trying to work with other stakeholders, the, uh, the, 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 the government, to see how we can be able to to facilitate the provision of appropriate uh, educational devices for online learning. We are looking at how to negotiate with the uh, internet providers for access to affordable internet because for online learning you require internet and internet is not, uh, is not cheap. We are trying to look at how we can be able to train our teachers online. We are looking at how we can be able to make sure that uh, learners and our schools have, uh, have power uh, that is uh, reliable electricity and solar. So we are giving those options so that when we fully uh, start the issue of online learning, everybody can be brought on board. And we are looking at how every learner can be accommodated through this particular program. It's not just about children in private schools. We want this particular program, once it is up and running from the private sector, it can also be shared with those uh, in, the, in, the, in the public schools. At this point in time, we are saying those who cannot be able to access online learning, we are developing what we are calling workbooks, where teachers work on something uh, through the workbooks, which is also shared with the, with the learners. And with time, learners are able to bring it back, and there is learning that is going on. Mm -hmm. Because we want to make sure that every other learner, whether they can be able to access online or the workbooks, but they continue learning. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, the, the issue of online learning, now that you brought that up, has really brought uh, a, a heated debate in terms of the inequality of education at this particular time. And Akelo, I'd like your input in this as well. If you look at even how mm, it has been implemented even by the government, uh, would you say it has, it has worked to the expectation that it was meant to work? Uh, thank you so much. I think uh, it, this is an area which has faced a lot of challenge. Yeah. Already, Cupet has carried out a survey and we have launched another survey to look at the effectiveness of the online learning and maybe the use of mass media to propagate education uh, which during this uh, emergency period. Uh, to, from our end, it has not been very effective because we are living in a diverse and uh, large geographical uh, uh, regions which are not connected properly with the internet or which have no signal at all. So therefore, learning uh, is being disrupted. As much as the KICD has done the, everything possible to ensure that they avail the, the content, it has not been communicated effectively through the channels. I was watching one lesson one afternoon uh, when uh, the Minister for uh, uh, Health was also uh, giving an update on the, on the issue. We have the challenge of using the, the TV and even the radio because the same, same gadgets were not uh, initially bought for the purposes of encouraging online learning. But they have been conscripted into this process because of the challenge which was caused by the long close of schools. So in our view, let us use evidence from what COPET is working on currently to, to give a proper uh, position on the effectiveness. But to the extent that we know, when people now give their emotional uh, reaction 
to what is taking place, it has not been very mm -hmm. effective. What is, this gap? what is this gap that uh, you have identified as COOPET and do you have a resolution for it? Uh, I have really said that we have launched, uh, we okay. only had a, a pilot. All right. But uh, we, are, we are now going into the in-depth of prop getting the proper response on what we have. What we think we should encourage is uh, what I said earlier, which is going to physical preparedness in uh, times of emergencies like this. That if we have cont uh, contagious disease, did we have in place education in uh, emergency? Because this is something which, like, uh, uh, if I pick one example which is happening in the Middle East. The Middle East, the Israel-Palestinian issue has been there for a long time. But you realize that education is not disrupted. The learners are ready to undertake learning. They go to public transport. They know very well that when a bomb strikes, this is how we take cover, <laughs> and therefore learning takes place. But in our situation, the education was disrupted, and therefore everybody now started scampering for clutching on anything which could help in the, in the circumstance. And that is how we find ourselves not properly coordinated in the online platform or the use of mass media. It is not properly coordinated. Remember prior to this, the students were outlawed to use the, the phones in schools. Now the parents did not even have phones for, uh, for, 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 for their learners because it was outlawed to be, uh, to be seen to be having a phone. Mm -hmm. Now that one now has become a real issue. That, that is the platform where you, you are supposed to undertake learning. But secondly, I, I, the online learning as it is carried out uh, does not have a proper policy framework. So we have the, uh, the, the, the issues of cyberbullying and children are, uh, are bullied through the same because you give children the opportunity to access the internet which does not have safeguards because the phones are not customized to be used by students alone. So you realize that people have also found opportunity to come there. You realize even some people also now want to, to organize lessons uh, because they think they are more clever. I saw one member of parliament uh, organizing <laughs> a lesson and saying that really? he's more clever than the permanent secretary of education. I, so, I didn't <laughs> see that coming. <laughs> you see that thing. So, so these are things which, which, we, which are there. We need a proper policy framework. A legislation, we need uh, a regulation that this is, we are now on, uh, on learning during emergency and these are our, our parameters so that we know our bounds. So that nobody just come up because he's too clever mm -hmm. so to come and teach our children. It is going to be a mockery of sorts. Thank you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Some people coming up because they think <laughs> All right. <laughs> so we want to move this conversation to uh, something that has also been a hot button, the issue of repeating of classes. I've brought in online education because for some schools, they felt they had invested enough in terms of ensuring that there is seamless learning and the learners, even while at home, they continue with the classroom experience. But then right now, as it stands, it was announced that mm. perhaps next year, you may not be allowed to move to the next level. So raising a lot of questions, and this is even what we are asking you on our viewpoint our question this particular morning, because we want you to be part of this conversation. Should basic education learners repeat uh, classes? Do you feel basic education learners re should repeat classes? Should basic education learners repeat classes? That's what we are asking you this morning. And we want you to interact with us on social media at KBC Channel 1. And at Safin Aching as well, you can share with me your thoughts. Do you feel basic education learners should repeat uh, their classes? That is something that uh, has really caused a heated debate. And this would like your input, uh, Ndoro. Uh, coming from a private sector perspective, this is one of the sectors that really invested um, in, in making sure that even at home, uh, learners continue with the, 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 the syllabus, learning continues, and then now there is that provision that uh, it's, it's no longer business as usual. You, if you're in grade four, you may not move to the next level. How do you read this particular directive, uh, if, considering that you are also part of the committee that mm -hmm. <laughs> came up with some of these new proposals? What do, you, what do you think, what do you feel is going to be um, the situation on the ground moving forward? Uh, very well. Now, 
this is a very weighty issue about uh, repetition. I want us to, 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 to ask ourselves uh, uh, very critical questions about repetition. We ask ourselves, what informs transition? What informs transition in our country? What does our law say about transition and repetition? We need to ask ourselves, in the uh, first term of 2020, did our schools cover the content for first term? What period had been left before the end of first term? And the answer is, a majority of our schools had actually covered the content for first term. And uh, what had remained is actually an examination period. The cabinet secretary, when he was making his pronouncement, did indicate that whatever decision that he had given was not actually cast on stone. That schools can reopen earlier if circumstances change. If new information comes to the stakeholders, then that decision can be reviewed. Mm -hmm. So what I want to put uh, to you this, uh, this morning is that uh, the issue of repetition is a subject that we need to, to, to seriously consider and relook at. Because when you look at our system of education, uh, transition is about age. Our education system is age-based such that if a child was to go to class one, the first question would be, is that child, uh, has that child achieved the age of six? When I was going to school during my time, I was asked, can you be able to touch <laughs> your hand in the other side? If yes, you directly go to, to class one. But things have changed. Things have really changed. So we need to ask ourselves, can we reconfigure our, our, our teaching and be able to accommodate what children may have missed so that at that particular point in time, we can transition learners rather than probably saying that they have to repeat the entire year. I think this is a discussion that we need to consider as mm -hmm. stakeholders and look at what is the best for the, our children and for our country. So, so repeating of classes may not be the best way forward from where you sit. Just want to uh, get a clarification on that. I'm not saying that it might not be the best thing to do, but I'm saying there is something that we can do, right? If, for example, things change in as far as uh, COVID-19 management is concerned, and the Ministry of, uh, Ministry of Health advises us that, uh, yes, it is now uh, safe for us, for us to reopen before January, we'll reopen. Mm -hmm. And then we reorganize our syllabus to ensure that content is covered so that children can transition at a certain point. What if the state it is not a remains? must. It is not a must that children has to have to transition in January. We can still reorganize our, our, our classes and our teaching so that children can transition at any other time. They can transition in May, they can transition in September, mm -hmm. and that is a discussion that we want to, 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 to engage so that we find out what is the best for us. Because our children are stressed at this point in time, parents are very concerned, we need to ask ourselves, must our children really repeat? Must our children repeat? must they repeat and that yeah. is what we are asking you as well on our viewpoint question why don't you go online on social media at kbc channel one at safin underscore aching and answer that question for us what do you think do should learners uh, in basic education repeat their classes we are going to be taking a very short break right here on news check we are coming back with much more Jana, ni mimo ulikuwa na natuangia hii simu ama ulikuwa umekonfuse. Panya hivi, ndio ni joo kushua, kwa sakata hii simu, alafu unangalia kama ni mimo ulikuwa na kama ni mimi upigia tana na taangoja. 
Usikawi ninakungoja hapa nikichunga. Pata Ero Ukoshua bonyeza star 811 star 961 hash. Bonyeza star 811 star 961 hash. When the world changed, it made us go back to the simple joys and love the little things even more. Like serving up your best, eating together and sharing more. Now, oh, we'll take nothing for granted. And always remember to taste the simple joys. Coca-Cola. Taste the simple joys. On the next episode of Kona. Nini niyo nafanya? Machamp uwa wa fight hivyo. What did he want anyway? He didn't help out one way for free. I'm not judging you. Everyone else did. I know exactly what it's like to be judged by society. I've never seen him this upset, holed up in his office for like the past two days. Watch out. Any ideas? Z. You're lying. Embakasi utawala tuko locked ungem au tanyaururu kasuku massive Jeshi ya nyeri, kosa maua, nakura kwa locked mbaya Kigumo ward, nambo watu wakondani ya KBC Channel 1 Nakulaliki, Wednesday, Bira the Rev Mbotela, outer idara, kitengela Kiambu County 33 pipeline, meru anawakilisha Rungai, maboksa, pale go down Karatina, outer mlolongo, wana enjoy show Lari, sub county, outer gidurai 45 Lanet Barracks, tuko nani yake Okongo, outer carnation, maragwa, seti Nairobi, kufeka wako locked mbaya sana watu wangu wanakuru ngwaro outer gilgil live kutoka mazeras bahati massive embo thika massive siya shikambi kakamega bungoma county kusia boda kisum city malindiote ikondani ya the ref when i'm in kenya i tune in to the rail get your mind brave focus conscious kenya east africa right keep it locked Hamjambo wa Kenya wenzangu. Mimi ni prosecutor. Niko hapa kusisitiza maagizo ambayo tunapewa na Wizara ya Afya kuhusu ugonjwa wa coronavirus. Tunaambiwa pahali pana watu wengi lazima tuweke distance, yani kuweka hatua mita moja kwa mwenzako. Ukienda kwa matatu, weka distance. Ukienda kwa soko ama pale popote mkutanjiko wa watu, ni vizuri uweze kupeana hiyo social distance ili tuweze kum kumaliza maambukizi. Tukifuata haya mashelti ama maagizo ambayo tunapewa na Wizara ya Afya, hakika tutaangamiza corona virus na hali yetu ya kawaida tutairudia. Asante sana.
Manchester United are oozing with confidence ahead of their Emirates FA Cup semi-final showdown against Chelsea, whose desire for trophies cannot be underestimated. And he picks out Barkley, who scores. It's a super goal. It's a good setup. Martial was in the... Maguire! And he has won it! It is another must-watch match live and exclusive on KBC Channel 1 on Sunday, the 19th of July from 8 p.m. Welcome back and thank you so much uh, for staying with us. In case you're just joining us, this is News Check. And today we are talking about the status of education and the impact of COVID-19 in the education uh, sector. And I'm hosting a panel of two gentlemen, the CEO of the Kenya Private Schools Association, Mr. Peter Ndoro, and the Secretary General, Kupet Akelo Misori. Thank you so much for staying with us. And of course, we are also inviting you to be part of this particular conversation on our viewpoint question. That's where you can be able to share your thoughts and views with us. And this morning we are asking you, should basic education learners repeat uh, classes? Just a reminder, we are asking you this morning, should basic education learners repeat uh, classes? That's uh, forming part of the conversation we were having here in studio and we want your thoughts as well on uh, what we are talking about. And that is where I want us to pick up from gentlemen and just a lot of issues that are being raised with regards to this new proposal like uh, Ndoro was sharing earlier it may not be cast on stone maybe maybe not it could change going by how the curve is going to go when it comes to the spread of COVID-19 so I will call it a proposal just uh, courtesy of that particular directive but then Akelo, if you look at, you know, this particular directive and its impact, its ripple effect even in the coming years, uh, what do you feel about the repeating of classes from where you sit? Was this the best way forward of approaching this particular pandemic and its impact on the education sector? Uh, thank you so much. You know, uh, Safin, uh, what is there is that um, leadership about uh, decision and about direction. In my considered opinion, I thought that is what was feasible to the cabinet secretary after considering the reports from the medical experts that it was not possible for uh, the nation to negotiate with the virus. And therefore, what is there is that the people, who, uh, the, the category or cohort of those who are terribly disadvantaged are those people who are already uh, registered for exams. And apparently this thing is going to be with us for a long time, given that we have suspended an entire year. And uh, the only challenge that is major in this is that uh, we have to contend with having so many of our children in school for a longer period because of this disruption. But these ones were unprecedented moments. They were unprecedented times that were occasioned by almost a state of war. And therefore, he, and it, is, it was a war which was affecting our lives in terms of health. It would be very, very important for everyone to understand that, he, the, uh, as the cabinet secretary said, that the children are more, we are more at peace because they are safe mm -hmm. and they are alive. Learning can only take place when we are uh, uh, healthy. But in the circumstance, the circumstances, who are not going to be favorable for learning to take place. Mm -hmm. As much as it has disrupted, it is not going to draw the stigma which comes with those who are compelled to repeat because they have failed to pass an exam. These ones are repeating because the state of our health and public health in the nation cannot guarantee. So the stigma uh, that is usually 
tied to repeating of classes? It is How do not we deal there with that? because nobody has gone ahead of everybody else. Remember, even the international schools, the private schools, as much as they are endowed, they are carrying out their online learning and so on. Everybody is, is equal in this. And therefore, the inequality which may come as a result of this is not there. Mm -hmm. What is there is that we are now going to surpass our, our regulation, that the law which stipulates that uh, children go to class one when they are already six. In the circumstance which follow is that, you remember those who are in PP1 are not likely, PP2 are not likely to go to class one or grade one for this mm -hmm. matter because of the new condition. So these are unprecedented moments that we need to understand. From my where I sit, I thought it was the best, uh, the decision. best decision made so far. But Remember what was supposed to be done if we were prepared to to stomach most things was to reorganize our curriculum, to make transition as it is happening elsewhere. Like in UK, uh, they, 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 they decided to use. Uh, marks and uh, uh, what we call what the, the, the marks which they targeted these students because they follow each learner uh, every stage of life from the time they went to school up to now. So they could easily project and they could give uh, a rough estimate that this is the aptitude of these students and therefore can easily just go. Mm -hmm. So that is what happened. And in, in, in essence, we have not developed that one as a nation. So it was going to be very difficult to develop that, to make it a criteria that our transition at class, uh, uh, at, uh, at uh, grade eight is now seven years and a half or and a quarter. Mm -hmm. That is what makes you to go to form one. And maybe for, for you to qualify to go to the university, you m could need not to finish form four. So this element was not cut out for. Mm -hmm. It would have meant that we could have had that kind of arrangement. But we found it very difficult to, to convince Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development to come up with a, a, a makeshift curriculum for this matter just to manage transition. Mm -hmm. So that is the, 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 the challenge. Yeah, change yeah. is really not yeah. something easy yeah. To, yeah. To, to really implement. Yeah. But then this is going to have a ripple effect that may take years to recover from. Don't you agree, Mr. Ndoro? I it's totally not just an issue of 2020 or 2021. Mm -hmm. We are looking beyond 2021. How, how is this going to affect the learning curve going forward? Yeah, I think uh, this is not uh, a very light matter. It's a weighty issue. It is going to affect very, very uh, many years to come. Because remember, uh, a majority of our students complete their education cycle at Form 4 at the age of 18 years. Now, with the repetition of uh, students for all grades, it means that now the completion uh, time, the completion age of the Form 4s will now be shifted to 19, meaning that we'll be having adults in, uh, in our secondary schools. But then, as uh, Akelo has said, this was a good idea, which we all supported. It was a good idea. But I want to believe that a good idea can always uh, pave way for an even better idea. But this idea should be based on new information that we can all agree to. Because we are saying, if the Ministry of Health uh, uh, advises us otherwise, if the World Health Organization discovers something that can, be, uh, that can assist us a great deal in managing COVID-19, what is it that can be done? If we can be able to accept and agree, as teachers in our institutions, we can do this much. Right? What is it that can be done so that we can be able to avoid the issue of stigma associated with repetition? Because there are children who are saying, I cannot be at this age because I cannot be in this class because of, of my age or something. Yeah? I cannot be in this class for two years. There is something that will affect the children psychologically. Mm -hmm. So as stakeholders, I think it would be good for us to look for information and be able to, to think through this particular issue of repetition so that when we get to 2021, at least we are better informed. And then if we are saying that children have to repeat, they are repeating with a, a very good reason. Yeah? If we have to transition, we look at how best can we transition. But as Missouri said, that was a good idea at that particular time. Right. And we still believe it was a good idea. Right. But we can still uh, uh, look at ways and means of how to, to make that idea even better.
All right, we can panel beat the idea. Yes. <laughs> In a bit, we'll be crossing over to the coastal region to catch the latest from that part of uh, the country. But before I let uh, uh, Akelo come into this conversation, I, I just want to get a, a, a quick thought uh, from uh, you, Mr. Ndoro. You, you are proposing an adjustment on how uh, we deliver content to learners. Do you think they can accommodate, um, you know, this much within one year? Can it be squeezed to fit and ensure that that transition happens uh, in relation to the proposal you're putting forth? Can, is the mind and can our learners really manage to accommodate that much of, of a content when it comes to covering the syllabus? You know, we are talking about content that was supposed to be covered for term two and term three. Can it be shrinked within a year and still that's the content that they were supposed to cover? Yes, that we can year? make arrangements uh -huh. because when you look at our, 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 our learning hours, mo in most schools, learning ends at around 3, 310. We can add an extra hour per day, for example. And I don't think that will be too much for our learners. We can be able to, 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 to condense uh, uh, our learning and ensure that children are able to cover that content within a particular period in time to be ready for transition. So it is possible, it can be done. Teachers, in most schools, teachers complete their syllabus way ahead of uh, October, yeah? So if it has always happened, why can't we do it now? It mm -hmm. is something that can be done. It is possible that teachers can be able to, 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 to navigate through the content and be able to ensure that learners are able to cover what they're supposed to have covered in their current grades within a certain period of time. Mm. It is not that it has to be done within one term. It is not that it has to be done within a month. It can be spread across, across the year and it can be done. I All think right. uh, I, I wanted to make some contribution to this. Mm. Go ahead. Uh, you know, th in this nation, we seem not to be very ready to, to be very radical in the way you make decisions. Like, uh, if I, my memory serves me right in the history of education in this country. In 1965, 66, uh, there were two CPE and Kenya African Preliminary Examination, CAPE. Uh, those who went to Form 1 in 1966 were two, two cohorts, those who did CAPE and those who did CPE. Uh, these are things which, which have happened. Uh, and uh, they, 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 they transited in that form format. You know, one, one thing which is uh, affecting us is that we are not ready to, to take bold steps as a nation to say this is what we must do to manage transition. For example, there would be nothing wrong if class, uh, uh, the current class uh, uh, 7 and class 8 sit for uh, the same exam. At that point, mm -hmm. at some stage, if we just want to manage transition. Because one thing is, uh, exams which are set are basically one and a half hours for class eight. And they, they test a very small section of what these people have learned from, from maybe class four up to class eight. Very small section. What is required there is basically to uh, ascertain whether they have the aptitude to undertake what is there in form one. So this is what's going to happen. Even at Form 4 level, what is being tested at the end of Form 4 mm -hmm. is the, uh, at KC, uh, KCSE is not necessarily what is learned in Form 4. It is the whole course as it began in Form 1 up to that level. Mm -hmm. So if you were ready to make such kind of arrangement, it could have worked. But it could have affected the perception only, not because people are, those who are going to transit to university are weak, it will only have affected perception. Mm -hmm. And if we, are, if we are ready to deal with the perception bit of this, it could have just worked. Because we must accept these ones are unprecedented moments. How uh, other nations, uh, we, we, some, 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 some Kenyans leave this country to go and take bachelor's degree in, in China where the, the courses are learned, learned in Chinese. Oh. How do they make it? Some of them go to France, to where the courses are done in French. Some of them go to Germany, where the courses are done in German. So okay. how do they uh, have a, 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 the semi cool kind of uh, a entry requirement to those grades? It is because of perception that we, we want to be very rigid, mm. and therefore <laughs> if, as Ndolo says, 
we need to have a very strong conversation so that everybody moves together. This is our nation. And if we, if we, we are going to be affected adversely by age alone, then we can, we can sort it out. Mm. Yeah. The issue ties to what was, uh, mm. you know, the conversation that was happening initially on whether to allow only the, uh, you know, learners in their final year to resume uh, their learning and others to stay at home, you know, which we, we had could even just cause a logistical challenge because this then would mean that if they've sat for the examinations, they have to transition. What about these others? But we'll talk about that in a bit. Right now, I want us to go to the Milimani Law Court. So this particular morning, there is a currently underway a pre-trial hearing uh, that touches on a case uh, touching on the Nairobi Governor Mike Mbuvisonko and 16 others who appeared before Chief Magistrate Douglas Ogoti at the Milimani Law Courts. They are facing 19 charges of corruption, abuse of office and irregular payments that saw the county lose about 357 million shillings. Currently speaking is lawyer Tom Ogenda. Let's uh, listen in. We will then come and show the court why this was never intended to be a trial and why this resolution has never been ready seven month, months down the line. Yes, Your Honor, lastly, today you need to give clear directions. You, you, you gave orders. Once you give orders, they should be complied with. The orders were put to trial. The prosecution is seeking an adjournment from the back, so they're asking to put an adjournment. But they've come cleverly because they're not telling you to give them an adjournment, they're telling you to give them a day to argue their application. We have to rule on that. We pray that we get it. Corresponding to Honor, we pray that grant us the requisite need to also apply some of these proceedings. Should we be guided or should we be ordered to appear in the next time? That's what it is. All right, so that is uh, an issue that is currently underway at the Milimani Law Courts, uh, the pre-trial hearing of the case that touched on the Nairobi Governor Mike Mbuvi Sonko. Sixteen others also appearing together with him this particular morning before the Chief Magistrate Douglas Ogoti. It's a corruption case that saw the Nairobi County, now known as the Nairobi Metropolitan Service, lose about 357 million shillings and uh, other charges that he's facing touch on, among others, corruption, abuse of office, and irregular payments. Uh, earlier, lawyer George Kithi uh, also uh, made his submissions, and he argued that they were not served with applications as the court had ordered. And of course, we've had their lawyer Tom Ogenda also making his submissions, saying they hadn't received several documents for a fair trial. And he was also talking about sorting to be supplied with 53 documents from the ESCC and DPP. So it's a case that is currently ongoing, and we'll be taking you back to it as soon as we get more updates and new information. But we have our very own Serafina Roby, who is also tracking what is happening along the corridors of justice today. So be sure to get a comprehensive uh, report on what happened at the corridors of justice in our subsequent news bulletins. In studio, we are talking about matters education and how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected the uh, education sector. As we speak this particular morning, over 13 million people globally have tested positive to the novel coronavirus. 572,000 people have succumbed. And in our country, as that yesterday, over 10,200 people tested positive. And of course, unfortunately, about just close to 200. The number stands at 197 people have succumbed to COVID-19. So this deadly virus has caused a lot of anxiety. Governments across the world have tried all they can to put in place measures to curb the spread of COVID-19 in our country. Quite a number of those measures have 
included even the closure of schools that have caused paralysis in the education sector. Now the conversation that has been simmering and it's now boiling is how to reopen schools safely. How do we reopen schools safely to ensure the safety of not just the learners but the staff which include the teachers and that is why we are having key players in the education sector this particular morning to help us understand all the dynamics that come with even the new directions that were issued by the Ministry of Health just a few days ago. And gentlemen, earlier before we went to the Milimani Law Courts, you were talking about uh, this issue of repeating of classes. And before we just wrap up that part of our conversation, from Akel, I'd like to understand, because I asked this question to uh, Ndoro earlier, I just also want to understand from your perspective what you feel is going to be the impact in the coming years. Uh, how bad is it? If, if we allow this to continue or what is it that is going to be affected in terms of how the learning cycle goes on in our country? Uh, uh, once again, thank you so much, Safin. I, I think uh, uh, Ndolo was very clear about it that we are likely to have overage students in school, the learners who are above the age of 18 in our secondary school system. And that is the major challenge. But uh, going back to the situation as it were, the decision to have education lost for 2020 mainly affects those who are going to to begin school in PP1, and that is a very that is the most sad bit of it. That we will be having many of them who are going to join PP1 because those who are who are in PP1 who had already carried one term are going to be joined by those who are freshly going to join in PP1. Mm. Are we get to that point? Yeah. So yeah. that is the mostly affected region. So this Otherwise means they will have to stay home for an extra year. For an year. extra year. Mm. But one thing each which is good is that because we are going to start where we left, that those people who are in, a, in a PP1 last year are going to be in PP1, PP2, in PP2, grade 1 up to grade, uh, grade 4, we are likely to not to have what we call over-enrollment in uh, Form 1 in the year 20. 22. Mm -hmm. We will just have the same number which we anticipated mm -hmm. because the same who are in uh, class 7 will go and do their year and therefore we will not also have uh, uh, those who are going to form 4 in the year 2022 mm -hmm. to be many. They will right. be just the same number. So, so that is what has been keyword. And right. therefore so when we look at the state of our economy, how we are progressively not uh, investing much in uh, establishing in the number of classes, it may not cause a lot of strain. And therefore, the year of the idea of teachers should also be sorted between now and that time mm -hmm. so that we create the social distance uh, phenomena, uh, supply water in schools, and also uh, invest uh, considerably on the idea of PPEs as it is going to assist in, in learning when we resume. Yeah. All right. So that, that, that idea of repeating classes has helped us to avoid a situation where we could have two cohorts mm. transitioning probably from uh, uh, primary school to secondary school, yeah. moving to the next level. But the, m the, the affected population are the ones who are supposed to be joining uh, the PP1, mm. the ones who are still at home. All right, we'll be coming back to continue this conversation in a bit, but I want us to now cross over to the coastal region this particular morning. One of the issues that are shaping the news uh, coming from the coastal region uh, include uh, an issue that touched on representatives of the Board of Management at the Dikirikani uh, Primary School in Mwakiruge Ward in Mombasa County. What they want is the fact that the county government is supposed to live up to the promise of finishing the ECD project, which was initiated in 2015, but uh, was expected to be completed in 2017. Still, it is a work in progress. Nothing has been done. A lot of ground needs to be covered. Joining us now live to give us the latest update is uh, our colleague Anburu. Anburu, what is the latest coming from this particular project? What are they saying uh, with regards to their hopes for the completion? Good morning to you, to Safina Cheng in studio, and you are coming live to you from Digirikani Primary School grounds in Makirunga area in Mombasa County. It is quite a sunny morning here, and uh, the issues that have brought us here today is that the county government of Mombasa had started an ECD project here at Digirikani Primary School, but until to date, the project has not been completed, and the board of management in this school are not happy about it, and they really want the county government to take initiative and finish the project because it was supposed to uh, finish 
finished uh, it was supposed to finish the project in two years the project started in two, 2015 and it was supposed to uh, to be through in 2017 but to date this building continues to lie here grass has grown inside the building there are no doors it is just a construction that is here and this construction site has also been an ISO to the parents in this area because most of this uh, the, the building right now is being used by the youth to engage in uh, mischievous behavior leading to the high rise of uh, pregnancy cases in this area in Makirunge. And right now I'll be joined by one of the board of man, uh, members, management members, who's going to tell us exactly what this project uh, is all about and when it was initiated and what they would really want the county government to do for them. Karibu sana. I would like you first to introduce yourself. You tell us your name and tell us exactly when this project was initiated. My name is Daniel Copandoro. This project was started 2015 and it was initially it was to be completed 2017 but by now it has not been completed so we are asking the county government to come up with this uh, uh, project to be finished before uh, the schools are reopened Maybe you could tell us what exactly uh, the county government uh, had initiated because initially I can see that the Girikani Primary School is just on my on my immediate right and uh, you decided to have the ECD on this immediate left. So you tell me exactly what initiated, what pushed the government of uh, Mombasa County to try and build an ECD here in Makirunga? Yes, I think the county government was just in, uh, involved regarding the number of the papers they came up and they found out the papers are just congested so they decided to to build this uh, this building here and we were very happy at the time when they came up with this project and uh, since then the problem is that they have not com be completed by now Maybe you've been able to, vi to visit the county offices to find out what exactly the problem is because if they had told you that the project was going to end in two years' time, what exactly has been the issue? Why haven't they been able to finish it? And if at all you've been able to go to the offices, what are the excuses maybe they have been giving you? Uh, since then, they, uh, they, told, uh, they used to tell us that they had no uh, funds, but uh, all we are being shocked all the time every year they, they are just budgeting for this building uh, in fact we, uh, we me plus my colleagues we used to visit the offices even we, we decided to bring the director himself mr mangi he came and he promised us in two uh, two weeks time everything is being, being is going to be completed but uh, we are shocked even now they have not done it so what exactly would you want the county government to do about this building? Well, this building, uh, like, uh, we are asking the, uh, the county government to, uh, to finish this building before January. So since 2017, uh, the students, have they been uh, coming to the classes or what exactly have you been doing to the students, the ECD students who are supposed to be? Since that time, we are taking these children to the primary, we are using the primary classes but they have not come up here. So we are waiting for, we, according to the regulations, they want this building to be completed, then we come, uh, we bring the children. But uh, we are using the primary classes up now, and the classes are, they are congested. And so long as we have this corona, we are, we are totally shocked because we will have to know where to keep them, yeah. Maybe you could also expound more on the challenges you're facing as the board of management because I believe also parents have questions why the building is here and nothing has been done. Maybe you could talk about the challenges that you're facing. Yeah, the challenges are there because, we, you know, we at the time when we had this building, we thought everything is going to become, be, be in a good mood. But since then, the challenges are there. We are facing the challenges. We are especially the children where they were keeping them. They are just giving us headache all the time. That's why we all the time we are visiting that area, uh, the offices, just to push this building to be completed. Yeah. Uh, now I'll be joined by one of the parents from Wakirunge, also uh, an activist in this area, who's going to tell us exactly what, as a mother, they face 
uh, in this area, keeping in mind that this building is just left on its own and she has alluded that uh, there are a lot of pregnancies coming out from this building because they continue uh, doing the mischievous behaviors in this building. Karibu sana yu, utanza na majina yako, alafu tatueleza tu changamoto ni zipi wewe kama mama na kumana nazo na pia kama mana harakati kuona kuwa hii project hapa imeweza kukamilika. Uh, kwa majina ni Constance Shivati uh, niko hapa degree kan primary ambapo tuk, ni, mimi kama mama ninasikia uchungu sana kwa ajili ya hili jengo limekuwa hapa kutangu 2015 mpaka kufikia sahi halija kuwa complete na hili jengo sahi limeleta changamoto nyingi kwa sababu milango iko wazi haikufungwa madrisha ya kuwazi ni watoto wamekuwa ni kama wamepata lodging zao za kuweza kufanya mapenzi ndani ya hili jengo. Kwa hivyo mimi kama mzazi wa hapa digirikani ninasikia uchungu kwa sababu watoto wenyewe wamekosa mahali kwa kusoma, watoto wanafinyiliana kwa primary school ambapo ingekuwa kamili wangekuwa wako hapa. Lakini kufikia sahi hakuna. Na hili na kila mwaka hili jengo linapangiwa pesa. Tulikaa hapa mwaka juzi tukaambiwa ya tukaenda kwa budget uh, participation tukae kwa public participation na tukaambiwa ya kwamba digrikani ECD imetengewa elf milioni 27 tukijua ya kwamba by that year itakuwa complete lakini mwaka uliisha jengo liko hivyo hivyo hivi tunaambiwa imetengewa elfu ngapi milioni milioni 26 na jengo bado liko hivyo hivyo. Kwa hivyo hili jengo limekuwa hapa limekuwa sasa ni changamoto kwa sisi jamii ya ya digirikani. Watoto wetu ni kama na kwamba wamepata sehemu za kufanyia mapenzi. Uh, that is all we have for you right now and uh, as you've had The, re the, the, the residents of the Girikani area want this project to be completed at least during this corona period. Uh, the government of Mombasa should do something about it. From Mombasa County, back to you in studio, Safin. All right, thank you so much, Anne Buru, for that particular update. We will be getting back to you just to hear more about the progress that is now going to be put in place to ensure the completion of that ECD project that has stalled from 2015 and was expected to be completed in 2017, and it is three years later, still nothing has been done. We now want to take you to Railway Restaurant. Uh, today, there are quite a number of health unions that had a press briefing talking about the healthcare workers and their welfare during this uh, COVID-19 global pandemic. Currently speaking, is the chairman of the Kenya Medical Practitioners, Pharmacists and Dentists Union. Let's uh, listen in. Thomas, the Kenya Union of Medical Laboratory Officers, the Kenya National Union of Pharmaceutical Technologists, the Kenya Union of Nutritionists and Dietitians, the Kenya Health Professional Society. Uh, these are uh, registered trade union and societies that represent all healthcare workers and uh, they have the mandate to represent them in all areas of interest. Uh, as a union and as leaders, we have we have just learned of the plan by the minister of health to 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 amend the health law amend uh, the health laws uh, uh, the health re regulatory bodies acts without the input of the members and the 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 acts that are proposed for amendment i will just highlight a few of them one of it is the the clinical the clinical officers and registration act number 20 of 2017 the nurses act cap 257 the medical practitioner and dentists act cap 253 the physiotherapist act number 20 of 2014 the Health Record and Information Managers Act, number 15 of 2016. The Mental Health Act, CAP 248. The Farmers and Poison Act, CAP 244. The Nutritionist and Dietitian Act, number 18 of 207. The Health Act, 
2017. That is the number 20, the 21 of 2017. The Counselors and the, and the Psychologist Act, number 14 of 2014. Lastly, the Medical Laboratory Technician and Technologist Act, CAP 253A, among other acts. Ridiculously, the memorandum of object for all the above proposed amendment health laws are uniform as follow. The health law amendment bill 2020 seeks to make various wide ranging amendments to various health related statutes on matters related to health policy to foster a model designed to improve efficiency, service delivery, realization of the universal health coverage and, uh, and the big four agenda among various bodies under the policy direction of the Minister of Health in line with the Mongozo, Mongozo. Health Act, uh, the Health Act, the Constitution of Kenya 2010 and other applicable laws. The Ministry further states that the proposed amendment are aimed to remove conditions, conditional nomination in the appointment of the council members to remove direct and indirect interests that have believed be bedeviled the opaque nomination process that have ended in the court as protagonist battle for the position occasioned massive loss of public funds. We as the health sector unions and, and the societies have premeditated on the proposed amendment and strongly feel that the, the memorandum of object provided above is superfluous and is without merit and I wish to table our response as follow. One, the main purpose of, uh, of the proposed amendment is to alter the, com the composition of the professional regulatory body by populating them with the lay persons of interest. The proposal to have non-executive chairperson is not in the, uh, in the regulatory bodies who is not necessarily coming from that particular profession stands to contravene and undermine Mongozo which dictates that, it, that the chairperson of any professional body must possess a technical know-how about that profession. Two, uh, three, the bill also proposes the removal of the Director General of Health from the regulatory bodies and replace that, that position with the Principal Secretary in charge of Minister of Health. This shall deny the professional, the professional regulatory bodies the benefit of the Director General as the technical advisor in all the regulatory bodies and the councils. It is common knowledge that in case of dispute in the councils or the regulatory body, the principal secretary is the ordinarily the arbiter, uh, the arbiter, the arbiter. Sorry, hence having him or her as a member of the council shall result into conflict of interest. All right, so that is also one of the issues that we are tracking for you currently speaking. There is the uh, Kenya Union of Clinical Officers uh, Chairperson George Gibore, and he's just representing the health unions that have gathered this particular morning to issue a statement with regards to the welfare of healthcare workers coming at a time when we are facing the outbreak of COVID 19. Among some of the issues that they want addressed as part of addressing the welfare of clinical officers is an amendment on quite a number of uh, laws. I'm talking about the Clinical Officers Registration Act, the Nurses Act, the Mental Health Act, among others that they've listed. Uh, they want uh, these to be addressed as part of just ensuring that the welfare of uh, the healthcare workers who are frontline soldiers in the fight against COVID-19 
is addressed. We will be following up that particular story for you and uh, letting you know more about what the healthcare workers want this particular morning in our subsequent news bulletins. Now we want to uh, continue with our conversation in studio. We were talking about the status of education and uh, what needs to be done even as we live in the reality that the COVID-19 pandemic has not spared the education sector in terms of its negative impacts. And I just want us to pick up this conversation and take it a notch higher. I'm hosting a, a panel of two gentlemen, Peter Andoro, the CEO of the Association of Kenya Private Schools Association, and of course, Akelo Misori, the Secretary General of the Kenya Union of Post-Primary Education Teachers. Thank you so much for staying with us. We want to now get to sort of a solution mode when we are looking at this particular problem, the gaps that have been created uh, in the education sector. And I just want to get uh, to Akelo. Uh, both of you were part of actually the committee of experts that were drawn to come up with a report and proposals on how to safely reopen the schools. I want us to talk about first the welfare of teachers, and this is where you come in, Akelo. There is a lot that has happened uh, in the past, in the few months that we have uh, you know just covered quite a number of teachers have lost their jobs and their livelihoods there has been pay cuts they've had to deal with they've had to bear the brunt of some being sent on unpaid leave I don't know if these are issues also that formed part of the agenda uh, of the committee when you are coming up with a report on how to address some of the issues that are being faced in the education sector what was said and what should teachers expect as a recovery plan uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Safin. Uh, well, well, let me first of all say that that was not part of the, uh, the mandate of the committee mm -hmm. to look at the welfare of teachers. But of course, the aspect we touched on teachers was basically how do teachers now do their, their work in the new normal? The new normal where the class sizes are going to be, uh, be, be many and the teachers are few. That is an aspect which was covered. But right, as we rightfully put it, quite a number of teachers lost their jobs, especially those who are in the private sector. And this is an area which we dealt with. We made so many proposals uh, to uh, cushion private schools, but not only private schools, but also to cushion schools which engage the teachers on B board or management terms. Uh, so in, in this country, Public schools also employ so many teachers on temporary terms, on, on BO, BOM terms. These teachers, when the schools closed, they only earned, the last time they earned was the, last, the month of March, and in April up to date, quite a number of those teachers in public schools who are engaged as BO board or management teachers have not earned, and therefore they are, there is a loss. But this is a, a challenge which is there globally. I saw even in the U.S. so many people had to fill uh, uh, what we call pension uh, forms and uh, nearly 40 million lost jobs. I want to say that for teachers in the public sector, they have been cushioned because the government has continued to retain their, their pay. But those who are in private sector, those who are engaged as, as board or management, were not. And this was our proposal. It would have been very, very important because the government has already uh, in, uh, uh, supported uh, private enterprises on what we call stimulus package mm. to ensure that the, those private enterprises are kept afloat. They don't lay off workers because workers are the worst affected with this COVID. We made this proposal and we hope uh, on two fronts that the government gives stimulus to private schools to keep afloat because they are not teaching private students. They are teaching children of Kenyans. Kenyan children uh, are the ones who are in public schools. And uh, they are, while the, the, the enterprises are private, the, 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 the education they are, are engaging is a public good, which is a great contribution. In fact, the contribution of private enterprises in, in the provision of education is, cannot be overstated because they have cushioned the, the public pressure or in the demand for education. So the idea of access, the idea of quality is something which the private uh, uh, institutions have really uh, helped. 
but look at it also from the par perspective of those teachers in the uh, board of management engagement. You look, for example, you took a school like Asumbi Girls uh, with a population of nearly 1,700 students. The number of teachers in that school who are employed by the Teacher Service Commission are basically 36. Mm. No, no, 53. And uh, the, the school is supposed to be serviced by about 90 teachers. Mm -hmm. So over, over 40 mm -hmm. teachers are on board of management terms. Mm -hmm. These are the teachers we shall rely upon to provide education in the hour of need because of this COVID. If they go without pay, it means that we, they, they, they have become over vulnerable. The teachers have become vulnerable groups, and therefore this was something which the committee, although it was not part of its mandate, delved into so that we could cushion the schools. First, to ensure that they don't lose their mm -hmm. pay, but uh, secondly, the private sector also do not close shop. Right. I hope maybe Brother Dolo has already expressed how the long stay they are, they are out, they may not even be ready for the 2021 opening of schools. And that is exactly where yeah, I, was, yeah, I, I, was, yeah. I was going. Yes. Because we have yeah. less than six months to go yeah. and we are walking on a very shaky bridge yeah. when it comes to the impact. So that is what I'm trying impact. to, to, to yeah. say. Mm -hmm. It is very, very important that this matter be taken over by government to ensure that they either guarantee the private sector to get a uh, ba bank uh, facility so that they can keep themselves afloat, so that they can also sustain their employees who are providing essential service to this nation in terms of uh, offering professional duty uh, as, as teachers. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the government need also to, to cushion public schools which engage, which have all continued to engage uh, t t teachers on board of management uh, contracts. All right. We're yeah. about to wrap up, gentlemen. But Ndoro, very quickly, in the interest of fairness, from your perspective, how bad has it been? Mm -hmm. And how difficult is it going to be to sail through to January next year when classes resume in terms of taking care of the welfare of the teachers in the private sector? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Safi. I want to uh, indicate that uh, private schools have really suffered because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And as I said earlier, private schools do not receive any money from the government to support their activities and operations. And uh, therefore, when uh, the schools were closed, schools, because they had collected fees for first term, they were able to pay their teachers in the month of March, in the month of April. But then after that, there was a lot of crisis across the country because schools did not have money. So some schools decided to look for money elsewhere to pay their teachers for May in the hope that schools will resume in June. But that was not to happen. Today, as we speak, a majority of our schools have actually sent their teachers on unpaid leave. These teachers who are on paid leave uh, went home not because private schools were not performing, but because the country wanted its citizens and the children to be safe. And therefore, the learners and uh, the teachers were asked to stay at home. At this point in time, private schools do not have any other resource. We have engaged the government and we are asking the government to come in because private schools collectively have employed over 300,000 in direct employment. Mm -hmm. 100, over 158,000 teachers and over 126,000 uh, non-teaching staff who are directly engaged by private schools. In addition to that, Private schools have also facilitated the employment of over 600 in indirect employment to other sectors. But looking at these private schools, what is it that the government needs to do? The government needs to cushion the private sector so that these uh, Kenyans who are employed by these institutions can be able to get a livelihood. We have requested the government to provide a stimulus package, and we've asked the government to provide it in two ways. Number one is through a credit guarantee, where private schools can be able to access uh, credit facilities that is of very low interest and has a longer repayment period. We have also requested the government to also consider for the very first time to provide capitation 
to learners attending private schools. And this capitation should actually be used to support the Kenyans who have been employed in those private institutions. Because as we speak today, there is no law that bars the government from extending capitation to learners in private, in private schools. In addition to that, the private schools is also trying its best to be able to see how we can continuously engage our teachers during this period of uh, uh, medical crisis. And that's why we have said we are supporting uh, uh, learners through online learning. And we're asking the government to also come in and support the private sector by way of ensuring that KICD expedites the process of um, approving content and also the government to also ensure that they zero rate appropriate devices for uh, the, the digital devices for online learning. Number two is about uh, preparation for 2021. I know very well that it will be very difficult for most of us to be able to set up infrastructure for the new normal. As we go towards 2021, of course, we will require to put in a lot of infrastructure, especially water, infrastru water and sanitation infrastructure in place. At this point in time, you find that financial institutions are not uh, are very reluctant to extend credit facilities to private schools. Mm -hmm. The reason being that uh, ordinarily when they're asking for, for, for credit facilities, they ask you to give them six-month statements. For private schools, the six-month statement has zero credits, and therefore it will be very difficult for financial institutions to consider private, uh, private schools for that uh, facility. In addition to that, this infrastructure for management of COVID-19 was, was not factored in in the previous um, uh, school invoices that were issued to parents. It is a new thing that has come because of COVID-19. Okay. Therefore, it will be important for all the stakeholders involved, and especially the government, to look at ways and means through which they can be able to cushion the private schools so that they can be able to manage COVID Thank in private so schools. Because it won't just be for private schools, but it will be for the entire country. Thank you so much for your time. And of course, we've learned a lot from both of you gentlemen this particular morning. COVID-19 has come with quite a number of negative impacts, but it has mm -hmm. taught us quite a number of lessons that we need to implement to avoid finding ourselves in this particular space in the coming future. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Peter Ndoro, the CEO of the Kenya Private Schools Association. And also I was uh, speaking to Akelo Misuri, the Secretary General, the Kenya Union of Post-Primary Education Teachers. Thank you so much for creating time for us. And thank you also for those who took time to share their thoughts on social media. Uh, we are having one Mary Mugo. You're saying no, learners should not repeat classes because unfortunately we are coming at a time when... Uh, our, education, our education system, I beg your pardon, is uh, very unfriendly and some of us cannot wait to just finish. Then we're having one, uh, Peter, no, Peter Kagia, you're saying, uh, thank you so much uh, for the show, quite in, informative. Uh, and you're saying, yes, this is the best approach because education is about quality and not quantity. Thank you so much for all the feedback that we've received this particular morning on the show. We are now going uh, to be taking you to an event that is happening at the Pumwani Hospital right here in Nairobi. Among others, also touch on the stepping up efforts to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. We leave you with that update as we await and pave way for the soil version of the program. Nancy Okware will be taking you through that. My name is Safina Cheng Oma and our sign language interpreter has been Lucy Maura. was very low. But what we have done is we have scaled down the services so as to be able to tackle all the services we offer in this uh, facility. We do have uh, Isli Health Center, Ngara Health Centers, which are able to take up some of the deliveries, normal deliveries, to assist Pumwani due to the shortage of staff as a result of uh, the isolation and the quarantine of the contacts. But Pumwani is open for emergency cases, so nobody will be sent away from this hospital if they come for emergency services. I want to urge members of the public not to stigmatize our hospital or our health workers who may be found who, who, who are positive. Because as you all know that 
the infection rate is uh, going high. There's a lot of community infection. So we cannot say our staff got the infection here or in the community where they come from because they are members of the community like everybody else. So let me take this opportunity to invite the Acting Director General of Medical Services to also give his comments. Dr. Amos. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kibaru. Uh, we are here basically with a team of uh, the Director of Nursing Services, Dr. Nandili, and the President of the National Nurses Association of Kenya, Mr. Bengo, on a fact-finding mission to be able to see for ourselves what is happening in women's hospitals, and in view of what uh, the director has indicated, of course we know we have had the targeted testing, staff members have turned out positive, and just, just generally to see the measures that the hospital has put in place, one, to stop further transmission of the infection, and two, to support the healthcare workers who have been affected in one way or the other, during this difficult period. We have had uh, fruitful discussions with the hospital management team, the measures that we need to put in place, including infection prevention control, like what you are seeing there. And I've been assured that we have sufficient quantities of PPEs, personal protective equipment. Further, we have agreed that beginning today, we'll have an isolation center dedicated for staff of the hospital at the School of Nursing for those who may not meet the criteria for home-based isolation. So basically ours is a mission of support and also fact-finding to help see what is on the ground and to assure the public that we are doing everything possible, one, to stop further transmission of infection to the healthcare workers, but also the people who come to seek services here. So the hospital is safe, or the staff who are working here are properly trained and will continue to give them support in terms of capacity building, in terms of proper gear, in terms of infection prevention control measures to ensure that as they work, they are not only safe when they are offering the services, but they also offer safe services to members of the public. So going forward, there's a, a remaining batch of about 100 staff members to be tested. Out of the 290 who are tested, 41 turned positive. All these 41 have been on home-based isolation. Two actually have been discharged from home-based isolation care. And the, rest, the remaining 39 are doing well. Nobody has gone to hospital for care. And we are hopeful that they'll be able to pull through without developing any symptoms of COVID. Remember, they qualify for home-based isolation because majority of our people are still asymptomatic. 90% of the infections we get in our setup are asymptomatic. Therefore, that gives us a very good platform to be able to implement home-based care uh, interventions. And also because you know home-based care is nine times cheaper than institutional care. So we support the uh, healthcare workers who are afflicted, but we also going to work very closely with Nairobi Metropolitan Services to ensure that a facility in the School of Nursing is immediately put to use. I think that's all. Maybe I can open it up for a question and answer. Please tell us. Yeah, can you coordinate that on our behalf? Yeah. 